This is the current federal tax developments for the week of February the 27th, 2017. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Nichols Patrick CPE, a division of the Los Calzo Institute and your state society of CPAs. This week, the question is going to be, what's my number? As we'll discuss, we look at an IRS release that came out late in the week that helps us deal with the collections issue. Now, some of the other issues we're going to look at this week is we're going to find a taxpayer that's unable to justify a payment or a deduction for a payment he made to a corporation that he had controlled. We find out that a debt must be actual in order to have a bad debt deduction, and the taxpayer in this case didn't have an actual debt. The IRS made public a list of organizations that have qualified as exempt using the streamline process of Form 1023-EZ. And a court rejected an estate's value for art because it found the appraiser had a conflict of interest, which the court felt biased the amount that the appraiser came up with, didn't help matters that the painting in question also sold for nearly five times the appraised value three and a half years after this appraisal had been made when the decedent passed away. Well, we're into this fun time of the year. We're almost to March. And I wanted to remind you of one detail that came up from a law change back in the summer of 2015 that we're just now getting around to having to deal with. And that is that the new due dates have now arrived and we're going to come up here in a couple of weeks on our first uh, time we have to deal with those revised due dates. So let's remember while we're in the heat of tax season that our traditional March 15th, get the corporation's extended date isn't quite correct this year. Remember, this year, calendar year partnerships and S corporations, but not C corporations, will have a March 15th due date. C corporation due dates will move back to April 15th. So the big catch you got to remember in all of that is to remember that your partnership due dates for an extension are coming up much quicker than they have in the past. Uh, trusts do not change. Trusts, remember, only have a change in their extended due date. So we don't have a problem there. But if you didn't quite get around to verifying that your tickler file is in proper shape or your software that takes the place of the old tickler files in proper shape, you might want to go glance at that right now before we get up to the March 15th date. And also you want to remind your clients that those due dates are a little different than they had been in the past. So if somebody goes ahead and gets a partnership return, they pick it up. We need to have that electronic filing authorization back a little bit faster than we need it back in the past. So just a reminder, it's one of those neat things that was a law change that went back over 18 months ago, but now we have to remember that we have to suddenly start implementing that law change because now the due dates are here. With that, let's go on to what actually developed this week. And the first case we have this week is a case that deals with a deduction for payments to a related entity. This is the case of Kaufman versus Commissioner Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2017-38. The case came down on February the 22nd. Now, the taxpayer in this case was a realtor and a cinematographer. He operated a number of single-member LLCs, all of which apparently were treated as discard entities, and he had a single C corporation. The IRS was questioning payments made from one of those single-member LLCs to the C corporation of $191,000 for what was labeled consulting fees, and $75,000 that were labeled commissions and fees. One of the first issues we run into when we discover in this case is the descriptions weren't really what the payments were for. When the taxpayer was asked to justify the payments, he pointed out that the corporation owned a specialized camera and that the he was paying the corporation to rent that camera from the corporation. Now, presumably, this corporation had other deductions that were going against this because our assumption is going to be that that's uh, what he hoped to offset. Well, it turns out there's nothing inherently wrong with leasing from your controlled corporation, but you're going to find the IRS is going to be a little more skeptical about it. The main reason for that is simple. If I'm leasing, let's say I go out and I'm leasing a car from Hertz Rent-A-Car when I go to do a session somewhere around the country, you know, Hertz and I negotiate a price. I know what I'm willing to pay. Hertz knows what they're willing to give me a car for. And so we have a two-party contract 
where each of us decided what it's worth. If Hertz wants to charge too much, I might decide that I don't want a rental car in this location. I'll just go ahead and use a taxi or a ride sharing service. And conversely, you know, Hertz can decide that if I'm not willing to pay enough, they're just simply not going to let me have the car. But if I control both enterprises, then no longer is there that tension between the parties. And that means we don't necessarily have an arm's length transaction. Well, that complicates showing the deduction. And the taxpayer said, well, this is an ordinary and necessary business expense. And obviously, if you're a cinematographer, uh, having use of a camera is definitely a, an expense that you expect to incur. And you would think that, OK, it's obvious I got to pay for that camera. But the court in this case pointed out that to be truly ordinary and necessary, by definition, you also have to show that the payment was reasonable. That's part inherently of the definition of ordinary and necessary. In this case, the taxpayers' only records that they had to justify the deduction were the accounting records. And yes, he did pay the $191,000 to $75,000 out. No question that was paid. But the court noted that's not enough to justify the deduction in this case. Rather, you need to show that the charges of, in this case, over $266,000 for leasing this camera were reasonable. And the problem in this case was he didn't give any evidence in the case of how he had determined what the price was that was going to be paid for leasing the camera, nor, and this probably would have really helped, had he been able to show that let's say he had charged X dollars per day for use of the camera. And if he had been able to show that the C corporation had actually leased the camera out to unrelated parties at that same rate, that would have also been very useful. We have to be a little careful here because sometimes clients like to set up these related entities and they do various juggling acts to try to shove income into one entity, maybe to use up some deductions in that entity and they, you know, and then allow it to, you know, make everything work perfect across the enterprises. Well, you got to be careful when you do that, that you can justify the amount of the payment being made between the related parties. If you're not careful, you can end up either, as in this case, with a total disallowance of the payment because the court found there was no justification for the amount that was paid, or you may find the amount's going to be adjusted and the transaction is going to be restated. That was the problem that was faced in this case. Next up, we go to a taxpayer who claimed he had a bad debt. This is the case of Schurer versus Commissioner, Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2017-36. Now, in this case, the taxpayer actually had two arguments for his loss. He claimed initially that he had a large business bad debt in this case, but at trial, he decided when actually it looked up after trial, his his briefs after trial went more down the argument of there being a partnership that a loss he had incurred, for which he'd incurred a loss, uh, because it turns out he kind of read the writing on the wall that this bad debt deduction wasn't going well for him. As you might expect, it doesn't go real well to change directions also mid-trial. So that kind of worked against him as well. Now, this gentleman had a friend who was planning to start a robocall operation that would market his services to individuals with high credit card debt. Uh, for a fee that organization, which was refer which was Continental Financial Services, referred to in the case as CFS, would contact the individual's bank and attempt to negotiate a lower interest rate on the credit cards. If somebody agreed to hire CFS, they would be charged an upfront fee on their credit card. Okay, let, 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 let's ignore the kind of uh, odd situation there that we're charging on a credit card for somebody who already has a credit card problem, but hey, we're going to accept that. There was one hitch in this plan, though. Mr. Schur's friend had a poor credit record, and he was unable to obtain a merchant account through which he could run credit card charges because, you know, the banks and the credit card companies aren't really thrilled with setting those up for people who have bad credit on their own. So he asked Mr. Schur to, if he could set up accounts and process the credit cards for Mr. Zinn. Mr. Schur set up a partnership with another individual, Mr. Jasikoff. Now, Mr. Schur had a 90% interest in this partnership, and his partner 
uh, basically was expected to manage the operation of the entity, prepare financial statements, and Mr. Schur put in all the cash. Now, it did handle the processing, but it turns out his friend's operation got into tr trouble rather quickly. Uh, when it came into trouble, Mr. Zinn approached the taxpayer, in this case, Mr. Schur, about providing additional capital. Now, Mr. Schur complained, as you might not be surprising, otherwise this enterprise finally shut down, was unable to, and never paid anything back. Well, the first problem with Mr. Schur's claims, he tried to claim a business bad debt. The court ended up with a couple of problems. The first big problem was he couldn't prove his actual advances except for one particular case. So the vast majority of his losses were disallowed up front simply because he had no documentation. But he could document a $19,800 advance that was made to cover a single particular payroll. Mr. Jasikoff, the other partner who did the accounting, he was able to show evidence of running down and making a payment to cover a payroll one day when the company couldn't cover a payroll. So the court said, okay, we recognize the 198 was advanced. Now the question is, was it a loan? This is where we run into problems. Number one, to be a debt, it has to have all the standard indi indications of a debt. In this case, one problem was there was no written debt document. A true commercial business debt, we would normally expect to have written terms and agreements. That's not there. But more important in this case is something is considered a loan only if we expect it to be repaid when we advanced it to the other party. In this case, his friend was financially troubled, had bad debt, which, you know, had bad credit, which we knew of ahead of time. Uh, he also was financially struggling, which we were aware of. And now he can't cover a payroll. It would seem highly likely that he was insolvent by that time. And you don't lend insolvent. Let's remember, he couldn't get merchant accounts because nobody wanted to lend to him anymore due to his bad credit. The court found there was no expectation of a repayment as such that wasn't a loan. In fact, they said the primary reason for this was because this was a good friend of his. And that's also not a reason to get a deduction. Now, he also tried to claim later, well, okay, it's a partnership. And he actually filed a 1065 late to try to claim this. The court had a little trouble there. They said, wait a minute. Because he tried to say he was the partnership running the robocall operation and he had hired CFS as a subcontractor. And these were prepaid expenses. The court said, no, you got it backwards. They said, there's no question. First thing is your partnership agreement specifically said you were formed solely to handle merchant processing, nothing about doing a robocall operation. Number two, the reality was, as we're all aware from what had been discussed in the agreements up front, CFS had hired your partnership as a subcontractor, not vice versa. So he also lost in his attempt to try to recover this by saying it was a partnership loss. The court found, sorry, there's no partnership loss either. Well, the IRS gave us some more information this week. News release IR 17041. Uh, if you have a client who has filed in the last couple of years on Form 1023EZ to qualify as an exempt organization, uh, the list of organizations that meet that requirement has now been made available by the IRS as a series of Excel spreadsheets, one for each year. There, so we have a spreadsheet for those who were granted in 2014 under 1023 EZ, those in 15, those in 16. The IRS announced that they have uh, they had approved through the end of 16, 105,000 organization applications had been approved via the 1023 EZ process. That is the streamline application for recognition of exemption. The IRS will continue to update this list by publishing new revised lists quarterly. So at the end of March, they'll take the ones through the end of March of 2017. They'll eventually put that up as a list. Then the next list will come after we get to the end of, of June, then September, et cetera. So if you have the list, if your client has applied for this, you can see the information that the IRS has on the website. The other thing the IRS continue to warn such organizations is do not put social security numbers on the Form 1023 Easy application. And actually, it's an electronic application. Don't enter that information in. They noted this is public and required to be public data. So don't put things there that shouldn't go public. 
Just a reminder, because sometimes people put that sort of stuff in. Next up, we have the estate of Colesman versus Commissioner. This is TC Memo 201740, issued on February the 22nd. This involved the valuation of two paintings in an estate. And there was a big difference what the IRS thought the paintings were worth and what the estate claimed. The estate claimed the paintings were valued at a half million dollars and a hundred thousand dollars respectively. The IRS position was the real values were two million one hundred thousand dollars and five hundred thousand dollars. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy. Now, part of the reason why the IRS was suspicious as we got to trial was three and a half years after the decedent died, these were sold at auction, or I should say the, the more expensive painting, the one that they claim is worth 500000 was sold at auction for over $2.1 million was the hammer price. And the buyer actually, after you got all the fees on top, paid $2,434,500 for the painting. Obviously, that's significantly more than five hundred grand. The IRS said, we don't understand why in the world it should have appreciated that wildly in just three and a half years. And we think that, in fact, the estate's appraisal is faulty. And the IRS had some points that they put out as to why they believed it was a faulty appraisal. In this case, uh, the appraisal was actually done for the estate by a gentleman with the auction house that eventually would sell the paintings. Uh, he came in, he appraised them, he looked at the paintings, uh, he appraised them, he noted that they were dirty. And that's part of what was going to come into play here. Uh, turned out they had the owner, the decedent, had been a heavy smoker. And the paintings had suffered due to that. In essence, it appears when we get to the end of the day that essentially they were covered in a brownish, yellowish kind of, you know, glaze, which obviously was the smoke that settled on the paintings during those years while they were in the house of this person who was a heavy smoker. Now, the appraiser decided based on, he claimed later, based on that, that he thought that the paintings needed a major decrease in value over what they would have been worth otherwise, because you couldn't really tell the real quality of the paintings because of the dirt on top of them. And he took the position that the paintings, that it was way too dangerous to actually attempt to clean the paintings. Dangerous or not, the estate actually did that. And they hired a conservator who came in and through a process the court will, the court described in details, cleaned the paintings and essentially removed the covering. The conservator noted that the dirt on the paintings was actually all surface and relatively easy to remove. Uh, they did some tests. They discovered, you know, they said they saw no very little or no danger in cleaning the paintings. They thought the danger was very low, and that's why they had advised that the paintings be cleaned. Now, the auctioneer said no. They always advised that didn't happen because there was a risk in cleaning the paintings that it could actually show the paintings was worth less, or it could damage, irreparably damage the paintings. Well, the tax court took a look and said, first thing is, we think that the auction house representative had a conflict of interest. Why? He wanted to get the uh, consignment to do the eventual sale at auction of the painting, which they did. The court decided that to do that, it seems reasonable that he would curry favor with the estate by giving it a low ball valuation that could then be used to pay much less in estate tax. The IRS had an expert who was who essentially is also an expert in art in historical art old masters paintings uh, and he had provided various comparables to show the value of the painting based on the artist in question in this case and also there was a little dispute over who the artist was on the second painting but he provided evidence in both of those the irs the tax court said first thing is your bias renders it questionable Secondly, your explanation for why it went up so much, you said, well, it's because the, the cleaning was remarkably and surprisingly successful. The court found, based on the testimony of the parties actually cleaned the paintings, that in fact it wasn't very surprising that the cleaning would be successful. And obviously, once that was done, it was obvious how much these paintings would be worth. The 
uh, auction house also claimed, well, no, in the interim, in those three and a half years, there have been an influx of Russian buyers. And because of that, there was a much greater demand for old masters paintings that drove up the price. Now, while they presented evidence of much higher gross sales at auction for old masters paintings during that period, at least, you know, some of the highest times they've ever had came during that three and a half years. What the court said, they didn't tell them how many paintings had gone on. So they didn't present evidence that the average price of a painting had actually appreciated. The court noted he also provided no comparables for paintings to justify why he had decreased the value so heavily for the dirty painting. The court was impressed by the fact the IRS's expert had a number of comparables, which, by the way, were awfully close to what he claimed as a value. And so the court generally accepted the IRS valuation knocking it down slightly by saying there should be some discount for the cleaning because there was some risk that would take place with cleaning, even if it was low. And also there should be a discount on the second less valuable painting because while it was probable that the painting had been done by the, by the artist that would command the higher price, actually it was a father son. The question was, was it the older or younger that did it? They said, because there was at least some question whether the younger had done the painting and that would command a lower price that because we couldn't be totally sure it was the elder that the court felt that that also would demand a discount over one where we knew it was the elder that had done the painting. But nevertheless, the court did point out that they were not going to accept it from a party that appeared to have other interests in play. Notice that can be important when you're advising a client on choosing somebody, you know, a client's looking at an advisor to do a valuation you want to be sure, you know, it's probably always best if you can to have somebody doing the valuation whose only interest is in the valuation. While I realize that person is being paid a fee and probably knows that if he comes in with a high value, uh, that's probably not what's expected. You still have a much better chance if it's only the valuation fee and there's no other issue in this case, because the auction house was looking to be able to sell those paintings it turned out to be not such a good idea ultimately to have used the auction house's own internal expert as the person to provide the value on the paintings. Finally, we have here IRS notice CP 40, which was issued and publication 4518, I should say, that were issued on the 21st. The IRS issued a CP 40 is the letter that will be sent when the IRS refers overdue accounts to collection agencies. Remember, the Fixing America's Service Transportation Act passed in December of 2015 requires the IRS to send certain accounts out to private collection agencies. The IRS also has a publication 4515 that will be sent to taxpayers that explains the process. Now, the form in question is going to have something on it that's important for taxpayers who are affected to notice. There will be a taxpayer authentication number found in the upper right section of the first page uh, where you have, you know, where they tell you what type of notice it is and the taxpayer's ID number, all that stuff in that upper corner. One of those things, there'll be a taxpayer authentication number. When the taxpayer is in contact with the collection agency, the taxpayer to start the call is going to have to provide the collection agency with the name and address of record and the first five digits of that number. Now that's done so the collection agency can be sure they're talking to the taxpayer. The taxpayer then is to get from the collection agency the last five digits of the number. That allows the taxpayer to be sure they're talking to the real collection agency. The IRS is getting ready to ramp up this program. You should be aware that you know, it's probably important to let your clients, including clients who have no balance due, know about the fact that this program will be starting because it won't be surprising to see fraudsters come back out and attempt to position themselves as collection agencies working for the IRS. So probably not a bad idea to have a copy of the CP40 letter available and to talk to the clients about how this will work. If you have clients who are in collection, and who may have debts going to the collection agency, then you need to let them have a copy of the CP40 notice. That will be the letter that comes to them from the, from the IRS when they refer to collection and remind them of the need to keep that taxpayer identification number 
authentication number if they're going to be dealing with the collection agency because that's how they're going to be able to prove that they're really talking to the collection agency. That's also how, assuming they want to talk with the collection agency, that they're going to be able to authenticate themselves to it. Again, you know, I think the bigger problem here is going to be with clients who do not have debts outstanding, but who get those calls where somebody's going to claim that we are representing the IRS in this area. Well, it's that time of year, of course, now, and we're all sitting here with way more things that are absolutely have to be done right now than can conceivably be done. The standard time of year when our priority list becomes, we don't want to look at that list. Make sure, you know, take time, relax, see what's going on. Also consult, as I've noted, your state societies do have various resources. Many of them have some access to some sort of resource where you can bounce tax questions off other members. That's always useful. Um, a lot of your state societies, this is something I think you need to recognize, part of where your money goes for the state societies. Uh, all of them have, you know, many of our state legislatures are now in session and those legislatures are now passing tax bills. And unfortunately, the timing for that is usually bad. Almost, you know, most of our state societies have committees that deal with those issues with the various legislators. And, you know, you should recognize it's not just your money, but it's the volunteer time of the people that are on those committees that do a lot to help represent the societies and your interest in getting a tax bill that's workable, not necessarily a tax bill that has all the policies you might like, but, you know, fundamentally, when we're trying to do returns, we need something that can be done. So be sure to consider the value your state societies bring to you. And also, yes, when tax season is over, be sure to consider the state societies for your educational needs so they can continue to represent you in these in the interest like in front of your state legislatures when we deal with tax matters. This has been the current federal tax developments for the week of February 27th. Uh, be sure to catch your day, our, day, our updates. We post them daily or as often as updates are relevant at currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com on the web. You can also get a download of the articles for today's uh, sessions from that same location, currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com. Go to the weekly update section. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Ed Zollers is my address there. If you have questions or comments, you can send them to Ed Zollers at currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, get ready. March is starting. So some of you, spring is actually, you can kind of see it on the horizon. Those of us here in Phoenix, unfortunately, we begin to see something that looks an awful lot like summer on the horizon. So we're not quite as thrilled. But the rest of you probably are happier. So take your time. Enjoy the week. Get some relaxation. And we'll see you back next week here on Current Federal Tax Developments.